Well, we're so glad that you're here for the second day of our program and the first day of the negotiations. My name is Ellie Vandegrift from the University of Oregon. And today's schedule is here on the screen where we have remarks from two of our plenary speakers today, Reese Jones and Ralph Chammy. And then we'll have an opportunity to move into the three rooms, the green, blue, and orange rooms. All the Zoom links are the same as last week when we were together. When we move into the rooms, this is when, when Melissa and Vivian and I will move into our roles of the UN Executive Secretary, Secretary General. And so we'll call those meetings to order and we'll hear the delegation speeches from each of you who have been selected by your team. And we'll then review the first round of pledges by our, our faculty colleagues who are playing the UN Executive Secretary for Climate. Then there'll be closed meeting discussions in your delegation and then an opportunity to move around within the, within the, the rooms, within the breakout rooms and negotiate with other people in the green room or other people in the blue room. So that's where we're headed today. If you have questions, please put them in the chat. One of us will respond. Again, thank you for those of you who've put your flag or your map as your background and changed your name so that we can both take attendance and we start to get to know and see who is representing which delegation today. And Tina, if you want to move to the next slide, if you have it. It is my pleasure today to introduce Dr. Reese Jones. Nati Kanu Nunu is a public health physician and senior lecturer in Maori Health at the University of Auckland, Ateu Rau, New Zealand. His research addresses indigenous health and health equity with a particular focus on environmental influences on Maori health and well being. He is passionate. He is a passionate advocate for action on the social determinants of health, equity, and indigenous rights. Thank you, Dr. Jones, for being here with us today. Yoda, thank you very much, um, and thanks for the opportunity to, uh, to speak with you today. Um, I call, call Reese Jones Toko Ingoa Heri Tenei No Ngati Kahungunu. Um, so that's just me introducing myself and, and where I'm from, uh, which is a little place called Wairua on the east coast of the, the North Island of New Zealand. Um, I will just share my slides now. And um, I was hoping to just briefly talk with you today about uh, this idea of, of climate action being much more than just uh, decarbonizing, but actually... Um, we need to think about decolonization uh, in terms of our, our action to address climate change. Um, and, and I come at this, as, as um, was mentioned in the introduction, uh, from a perspective of, as, as a public health doctor, uh, but really interested in, um, in how we can kind of put in place these solutions that, that address a number of different challenges and issues facing us as societies. Uh, rather than just a sort of narrow focus on greenhouse gas emissions. And, and this is hopefully conveyed in, in this kind of a, a slide that, um, you know, we're, we're sort of, we've come through the COVID-19, well, maybe still going through COVID-19 pandemic, um, but there are much bigger challenges um, behind that. And, and certainly the climate crisis is one of those. Um, but we, kind of need to understand that climate change is really just one symptom of a whole range of dysfunctional systems and, and um, crises that are that are driving our ecological um, disruptions like climate change and um, colonialism, capitalism, those real big systems um, and processes lie behind uh, the things that we're experiencing as things like climate change. Um, so I, I really like this quote that says, the ecocidal logics that now govern our world are not inevitable or human nature, but are the result of a series of decisions that have their origins and reverberations in colonization. And so, you know, really giving us the sense that um, 
the the types of ways that we've been engaging with nature, with the environment, with each other over many centuries have led to this point where, um, you know, we're now seeing across all sorts of societies um, the impacts in terms of climate change. Um, and really just to reiterate or make the point that the impacts of climate change are hugely inequitable and uh, and it's one of these you know really 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 unfair situations where uh, if we look on the on the top of this distorted map of the world it shows you know who's been responsible for the most greenhouse gas emissions and we can see that it's disproportionately uh, North America um, Europe, that, that are sort of blown up to, to much bigger than they normally appear on a map. Whereas if we look at who's experiencing the impacts of climate change and certainly who's projected to in the future, it will be Africa, India, you know, um, some of the small island de developing states, which are, you know, really barely responsible for any of the um, emissions that contribute to climate change. So a hugely inequitable situation. Um, we're also at a point now where I, th I think, uh, you know, we've seen from all experts, um, climate scientists, many different uh, people involved in different aspects of, of climate change, uh, calling for governments, calling for um, all sorts of sectors of society to act on climate change and act urgently. And we're seeing this major disconnect between what the science tells us that we need to do and what is actually being done by governments, by others, you know, in terms of the policies and actions needed to address our, our emissions and, and address the underlying systems um, behind climate change. And when, when we start to then think about how to act to address, you know, the, the emissions, the, um, the problems that are contributing to the, the um, environmental changes that we see, uh, often we, we get into the situation where the, the solutions are kind of very narrowly focused. So this is an example from um, our national emissions plan, um, emissions reduction plan here in New Zealand. And essentially um, what, what it tends to do is try to think, well, how can we carry on life as we are currently, uh, but do so in a way that has lower emissions and therefore lower climate impact? And, and I think that's uh, an ill-informed and, and sort of wrong-headed way of going about the, the challenges facing us because um, it tends to just, you know, recreate the systems that we currently have that are causing multiple, multiple problems um, rather than trying to understand them and address them from a systemic level. And so I, I think the emissions reduction in the transport sector is a good example of that. Um, our emissions reduction plan tends to focus on electrifying the vehicle fleet um, and so removing you know fossil fuel driven vehicles and in place of uh, and replacing them with electric cars um, but yeah essentially that might help to address our emissions but it does nothing to solve all the other multiple and really devastating complications of of having an auto dependent um, transport system um, so yeah, and, and here's just another kind of slide to reiterate some of this, that, that actually in putting in place these kind of surface or band-aid kind of solutions, what we do is just create more problems and, and different kinds of problems. So um, if we want to electrify the vehicle fleet, that's going to call for a hugely increased demand for batteries, for other you know minerals and other things that make up um, electric vehicles. And those things are associated already with massive human rights abuses, environmental destruction, you know, in the countries where those minerals are mined. And that's only going to increase, you know, multiple fold um, once we sort of scale up electric vehicle development and the electrification of, of vehicle fleets. So that's really just one example of, um, you know, how these, these kind of... Um, narrow, narrowly focused solutions not only don't help us to solve the problem that we're trying to solve fully, but they actually create a whole lot of other problems that we then need other fixes to try and address. Um, so it really is just a, um, can we get into a vicious cycle if we follow that kind of logic? 
And I really like, in, in this context, I like this quote that's sometimes been attributed to Albert Einstein, uh, that no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And I think that's really relevant when it comes to climate change and environmental challenges facing us globally, because we see that, um, you know, if we, if we really try and understand what are the root causes of climate change, it comes from this um, colonial capitalist sort of way of thinking about our place in nature as, you know, separating humans from each other and from the rest of nature so that as humans, we tend to try and dominate or control our environment and mould it to fit our needs from that um, colonial kind of perspective. And if we follow that logic through, we see all the kinds of impacts that have led to, um, you know, the types of activities that then generate emissions, um, cause environmental destruction, all those things that have actually been responsible for climate change. So if we want to tackle it, the last thing we should do is try and uh, use the same sort of thinking, the same sort of systems to address the problem. Um, so we, we've got to look away from colonial Western ways of engaging and think about uh, moving to other knowledges, value systems that can actually completely change the way we approach these issues. And, you know, indigenous knowledge systems are one of those ways that we need to think about um, how to tackle problems like climate change. And so, you know, privileging indigenous knowledges and the way to do that is to support indigenous self-determination so that indigenous peoples can um, express their own knowledges in environmental, um, you know, restoration and management of, of local resources, et cetera. That has to be a critical foundation for climate change and health solutions. Um, so I've got a few little examples on the on the slide here. Um, one is a large community garden that's um, located on one of our marae or sort of a, a, a Māori meeting place, um, which, you know, can help to address emissions from um, food-related emissions from climate change, but also help to do a number of other things, you know, um, it has, it's good for uh, cultural development, good for social, environmental, health benefits, you know, it has multiple, multiple benefits beyond just the emissions. Um, another one there is around uh, sort of what we call papakainga or local communal villages, which can help support um, communities and multi-generational kinds of communities um, but doing so in a way that there's shared resources, there's um, you know, kind of economical use of the resources around us so that we're not um, you know, consuming to the extent that, uh, that we currently are and therefore contributing to you know, escalating greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. Um, so, yeah, I strongly believe that Indigenous knowledges are a key way that we need to to think through how to address climate change. Um, and in, in any of our responses to climate change, I think we need to have justice at the centre. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, climate change itself is hugely inequitable and unjust. Um, often our responses to it can also tend to exacerbate those inequities. So we need to think through, and, and I've kind of been crafting this model of climate justice, which includes not just distributive justice or, you know, who gets the benefits and costs um, allocated to them, but procedural justice. So it's about who's actually engaged in the process and the decision-making, uh, relational justice, and that's between each other as well as our more than human relations and including future generations. Um, cognitive justice, which is about um, recognizing different knowledge systems, different value systems, and restorative justice, which is actually about um, addressing those historical injustices and making sure that we're not contributing to um, perpetuating those. Um, and all of this happens within a context, so we need to think through um, the way in which our, our broader social systems, um, you know, systems like racism, 
ableism, sexism are all operating to to um, potentially uh, uh, increase those inequities. And I think in all of our work in this area, I really like this kind of concept of trying to craft the worlds that we cannot live without, just as we dismantle the ones that we can't live within. And so I think that's really, that speaks to me about the need to dismantle systems of colonialism, capitalism that are driving the climate crisis, but at the same time be crafting the um, you know, human communal and indigenous knowledge-based systems that we need to actually um, create the world that we want to live in. Um, now that seems pretty huge and a massively challenging task in the face of you know, the huge systemic challenges that we have. But I think what we can each do in all of our work is to look for these, what I call positive relational tipping points. Um, so those places where we can, it might be something really small, but we can actually drive a wedge in, stop these vicious cycles from perpetuating, and instead try to turn that around and create a virtuous cycle so that we start to normalize um, anti-racist, pro-equity, you know, pro-Indigenous rights ways of transforming systems. And so I'm running out of time, but just to summarize, I, I think at, at its core, climate change is a symptom of severed relationships. So it's not just that we're, you know, accidentally admitting too many greenhouse gas emissions because we chose the wrong kinds of fuel to burn. It's about, you know, fundamentally those relationships and how we live as humans in relation to everything else on earth um, and renewing or um, you know rebuilding those relationships is critical so we've got to reject those solutions that are you know based on status quo thinking and uphold those same exploitative systems like capitalism colonialism center environmental justice and all those dimensions of justice and yeah as i say think decolonization not just decarbonization so, Kilda, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much. Uh, that was really wonderful. Um, so much to think about. Um, we do have some questions for you, uh, but I, I loved how you talked about really needing to think about the world that we're envisioning and not just dismantle the one that we can't live in. That was really uh, something that struck me. So thank you again for that talk. Uh, we have a question that is, how can outreach efforts ensure indigenous peoples are represented in stakeholder engagement? And is trust an issue in generating such engagement? And maybe I'll uh, stop sharing here so that we can see. Oh, yeah. oh, do you want me to stop sharing? Sure, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a great question. And I think trust is a a major issue, you know, um, we see that all the time. And, and just as an example, in the um, response to the COVID pandemic here in New Zealand, we saw huge issues with um, engagement of Indigenous peoples and things like the, the vaccine rollout. Um, and that's largely been attributed to a distrust of, of government services and kind of um, mainstream run healthcare services, which is understandable given the history of um, you know, colonization and the way that Māori have often been um, marginalized and sort of discriminated against through those processes. And so, yeah, I, th I think um, one, of the, one of the challenges we face is that climate change is, is really put this urgent sort of time scale on what we need to do to address our environmental challenges. But at the same time, we need to actually build the relationships and rebuild the trust and engagement with Indigenous peoples um, in order to enact some of those solutions. And that takes time. You know, that takes a lot of time to really build relationships, but it's something that we can't um, get around and, and it, actually, it actually is a critical part of, of tackling climate change. So yeah, it is about getting in, um, building those relationships with local communities, with indigenous communities, and um, that has to be a critical part of, of climate action. 
Thank you. Um, and another question is, would you say that we should direct a fraction of global funds towards addressing poverty, uh, since doing so would increase interest among people in poverty to solve climate change? Yeah, that's, so that's a great point or a great question. Um, and I think what it speaks to is the really interrelated nature of all these different global challenges or crises that we're facing that, um, yeah, certainly poverty and the massive inequities and in wealth that we see between countries, within countries, are kind of all tied up in the same systems that are driving climate change. And so I think absolutely tackling poverty is a, um, is a climate climate change action, um, you know, addressing indigenous rights or uh, revitalizing indigenous languages is a climate change action. Um, so these things are all critical because, you know, from the poverty perspective, actually a lack of access to resources and being, you know, stuck in poverty is a major barrier to communities taking action on climate change. So if we can alleviate that, then that you know will obviously support greater action by all communities um, to address climate change. Thank you. Uh, and someone you mentioned uh, each of us needing to look at a, a tipping point. Um, and so someone asked if you could explain a little bit more about that. Yes, I I, I might not have time to do that justice because it's um it's a little bit tricky but one thing i would do is um i'm not sure if you have access to the slides but uh i'd, I'd direct you to the the article that uh, myself and a couple of other people published in lancet planetary health uh, it was late last year um so the reference is on the slide and um i think that what that is trying to say is that there are these these relational tipping points, as well as our sort of more familiar climate tipping points. Um, and so we understand the sort of climate tipping points as, as things that, you know, will, will quickly um, create major um, warming or major environmental impacts as, as a result of climate change. Um, but we've also got these relational tipping points, which are about really relations between Indigenous peoples and others, um, particularly, you know, governments and um, settler communities. And so those things really, um, those tipping points, in a sense, have been breached a long time ago through the processes of colonization. And we need to actually address those relationships um, before we can start doing some of the, I guess, more um, more practical kind of um, actions in terms of tackling emissions and doing those other things, which is which is kind of why I, I say, you know, we need to decolonize and start to um, address those problems that have been created through colonization um, at the same time as doing the decarbonizing. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. And that relates to, I think, our last question, uh, which is, how would you make these types of events like the negotiations decolonize, uh, especially when you consider there are people in power who are still denying uh, that climate change is an issue? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, it actually reminds me, I, I had the privilege of going to one of the um, UN climate change conferences a few years ago. And um, I was really struck by the the contrast between um, what was happening in the in the sort of main negotiation rooms and what was happening in the Indigenous Peoples Forum, because I spent quite a bit of time in in the Indigenous Peoples Forum, and um, you know, in in that forum there was huge you know uh, passion and willingness to try and tackle these these really major challenges, whereas I think in the negotiation room. Uh, where we had all the government representatives there from the different nations, there seemed to be this, you know, the passion was really to maintain the status quo and, um, you know, sort of uh, fight against each other for any sort of very minor um, compromises rather than really trying to address the issues. And I, I kept thinking, 
oh, if only we could switch those rooms around. And, um, and I think that's kind of where we need to think from a global climate action perspective is, is how can we um, not just have Indigenous peoples as a marginal voice within that, but actually centre uh, Indigenous voices and you know, Indigenous experts in that, that whole decision-making process. Absolutely. Thank you uh, once again for taking the time to be here. We so appreciate your uh, contribution to our conference or our and our event. Thank you very much, and all, all the best for the rest of the event. Kia ora. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to our second speaker for today. I am very happy to introduce Dr. Ralph Shami who is currently Assistant Director and Chief of Financial Policies Division in the Institute for Capacity Development at the International Monetary Fund. Between 2009 and 14, he saw, oversaw the Regional Studies Division covering 32 countries in the Middle East and Central Asia Department and the Mission and Division Chief for Fragile States, such as Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Sudan, South Sudan, and Somalia. Uh, he's also very involved in NGOs such as Rebalance Earth and Blue Green for uh, Futures. And so we are very fortunate to have Dr. Shami here to speak to us. Thank you for joining. I know it's late there, uh, <laughs> but we appreciate you being here. Thank you. Thank you for the, for the invitation to be part of this wonderful event. Um, uh, if I, I'd like to get to my to my talk so that I don't uh, make everybody wait. Uh, may, may I share my screen? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Okay, let's see. And students, I would encourage you to look at the full bios of all of our speakers and facilitators, which is available in the event program. Thank you. So uh, what I would like to focus on today is, well, the title of the talk is how we, by investing in living nature, uh, we can guarantee a regenerative future for all of us, including nature. And, uh, and this is, I'm, I'm glad I came uh, after Dr. Jones because I will build on some of what he's, uh, he, uh, I, I'm fully on board with this point of view. So this actually it looks at it from the financial side, if you like. Uh, question is, where do we start this conversation? And uh, as uh, Dr. Jones was saying, humanity is facing not only uh, climate change risk, but I, I think most of us now know that we are facing two risks, at least. And it's the, the second one is the loss, is the risk to nature and the loss of its biodiversity. I mean, we have a, over a million species on the verge of extinction. So humanity is really facing twin risks, and uh, those two risks are linked through human activity. The problem that we are facing is that we cannot focus on one and then deal with the other, um, because both are happening at the same time. And if any one of those risks were to materialize, uh, we would be in great um, um, danger, uh, existential danger, actually. So, um, so how do we how how do we tackle these two risks at the same time. That's really the question. Uh, it turns out that those that focus on climate change risk, have, uh, they've identified that what we really should be d doing is, uh, as Dr. Jones was saying, decarbonizing the atmosphere. Um, they, re re uh, they refer to it as reducing the, the emissions and, and grabbing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Those that work on nature and and they want to they want to protect nature, they want to restore nature, they want to rejuvenate nature. Um, the question is is how do we do both? Because as I said before, we cannot do it sequentially. Well, it turns out there's actually an answer to this, and it's right in front of us. If we were to protect and restore nature, by definition, we would be reducing the risk to nature and the loss of its biodiversity. And according to the science, and this is the latest IPCC report, even the AR6 that just came out a few weeks ago, it says, well, if we were to invest in nature, 
and protect it and rejuvenate it. Nature has a capability to help us reduce climate change risk by at least 38%. So there we go. Um, we have the answer. We, we by, investing, by, by looking after nature, protecting nature, we reduce the risk to nature and rate nature boomerangs back to us by helping us to reduce climate change by at least 38%. The question is, how does nature do that? Well, this comes from the science. The science tells us, for example, because typically when you think of climate change and grabbing carbon, most people think about it in terms of trees. What they don't realize is actually the oceans are the lungs of the planet. And that's a realization, a more recent realization among the public, especially I saw it at COP27. It started at COP26 and really took form in COP27. So how do the oceans grab carbon? Well, biologically, through the phytoplankton, these are microscopic organisms that float in the oceans, and they do something really incredible. They grab about 30, between 33 to 37 gigatons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere every year. Uh, so they grab carbon and they give back oxygen. How much carbon do they grab? If you like to visualize it, that's equivalent to the work of four Amazon forests per year. Closer to shore, we have seagrass, salt marshes, mangroves, kelp forests, and so forth. They also help to sequester a tremendous amount of carbon in the sediments or in the roots. And they, but they do other things too. They, they provide for flood control. And when you have healthy seagrass and mangroves and so forth, and, and coral, uh, and corals, you have healthy fish stocks. The open ocean, that's something that doesn't get much attention, except very recently. This is the part of the ocean that doesn't belong to any country. So once you go beyond the, the zone that each country claims uh, to itself, that's the open ocean. And I, call, I refer to it as the orphan. It belongs to, to everybody and therefore belongs to nobody in a sense. So what the scientists have been able to gather is that for, the, for at least the last 200 years, since they've been keeping data from 1870 to now, they found out that um, the open ocean has grabbed over 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide between 1,000 meters and, and all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. And anything that is below 1,000 meters in the, in the water is pretty much sequestered forever. So... Flora, be it green or blue, um, in nature, flora, green or blue, help us in the fight against climate change. What else? More recent science actually shown that it's not only that flora grabs carbon and helps us to fight climate change, but also fauna in terms of animals. So this is work uh, on the left. This is work of, uh, carbon, of uh, Fabio Berzaghi and colleagues starting with 2019 paper in Nature, and now he's followed it with two new papers, collaboration with other scientists. They show that the elephants, these are the forest elephants in the Congo Basin, through the, they have a proclivity uh, for eating plants that are low in fiber and high in protein. What they leave alone are plants that are high in fiber, which means they're high in carbon. So the elephants like to eat plants that are low in carbon, but high in protein. And therefore, they, they avoid uh, you know, eating or foraging on, on, on trees, you know, big trees that, you know, that uh, basically grab a lot of carbon. More recent work by Fabio shows that it's not only the elephants, but also mega herbivores like the hippos and the zebras and others also have the same proclivity for plants that are in vegetation that is low in fiber and high in protein, leaving alone uh, the, the sort of the older growth that are high in carbon. How much do they, how, how, what's their contribution to carbon in the forest? The delta is between 7 and 14%, imagine, an increase in the carbon sequestration in the forest due to the work of these elephants. Their cousins in the ocean, these are the great whales, the nine species of the great whales. This is starting with the work of Andy Pershing of 2010. Those great whales grab a lot of carbon on their body. And because they're very heavy, when they die, they sink to the bottom of the ocean. And once they sink below 1,000 meters, unless that, that area is disturbed, that carbon is sequestered there forever. How much carbon on their body? Roughly about nine tons Per, on, an, on, a, on a body of an average whale, 
And if you multiply that by 11 over three, you convert it to carbon dioxide. And the, that's about 33 tons of carbon dioxide being kept out of the atmosphere due to the work of these, just on the body of a whale. That's equivalent to the work of about 1,500 trees, but of a single whale. But also the whales, uh, they do something really incredible through the way they eat. And, uh, you know, um, hopefully not going to have lunch anytime soon. So the way they, they eat a lot of krill and they poop a lot. And their, their poop has uh, ingredients in it that has uh, phosphorus, nitrogen, and iron. Those three ing ingredients uh, help to fertilize the phytoplankton and make the phytoplankton very active. So the whales are very smart. They poop at the surface, makes the phytoplankton very active. There's more phyto, more phyto. That means there's more krill because krill feeds on phyto. And then because there's more krill, there's more food for the elephants. And you get this virtuous cycle. But what matters for us is that the elephants, by fertilizing the phyto, they're helping the phyto fix more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So the, the whales directly on their body, in and directly through the way they fertilize the phyto, grab a lot of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So what this tells us is that not only flora, but also fauna, animals, also are great allies in the fight against climate change. All of this is known in the world of science. Now, from a, from a, I'm a financial economist, and so the question is, are these services by, by nature, by a living nature and thriving nature, are they valuable to us? Can we put a value on them? And the answer is yes, because what, they're, what these, what, be it green or blue, fauna or flora, they're grabbing carbon. And the price of carbon, of a ton of carbon today on the European exchange, for example, is about 100 euros. Now, why is the price of carbon over, you know, about 100, 100 euros and it's been increasing at this graph basically shows you is because in, when we got to the uh, Paris Accord of 2015, the world made commitments to go carbon zero, carbon negative, carbon neutral by 2050. Had they made a commitment to go carbon neutral or zero or negative by 2100, the carbon price would be zero. But the world made a commitment to, to deal with the carbon issue by 2050. But those commitments were, were predicated on actions that should have been taken at that point in time. But as Greta rightly said, there was a lot of blah, blah, blah. No action was taken. As a result, the time moved against us. When you make a commitment to, it, to, to a certain time and to, to do something and you don't do it, then that, that time, that date moves against you. So 2040 became the date that everybody was concerned about. And again, they met, they sang Kumbaya, they held hands, they promised to do things, and they did nothing. Suddenly now we're looking at the possibility of breaching the 1.5 degrees by 2030. That's just seven, eight years from now. So as you can see, you see that reflected in the IPCC reports talking about what should we do? The, talking about the urgency of, of the need to act on the climate side before things get out of hand. But it all boils around how to grab carbon from the atmosphere or how to reduce our emissions. From a finance point of view, an economics point of view, that means there's a great demand, an urgent demand for the technology that would help us grab carbon from the atmosphere. So that demand has pushing the price of carbon up in the uh, uh, higher and higher. In fact, the prediction is that by next year, the price of carbon per by a ton of car uh, the price of ton of carbon would be over hundred dollars. What does that mean? That means we can go back to the services of nature because nature is grabbing carbon and ask ourselves how valuable is the carbon sequestration service, let's say, of an elephant, well, or a whale. So we can ask that question on the left hand side. We asked that question a few years ago. We said, how much is the whale's carbon sequestration service worth to us? Well, it turns out that the carbon sequestration service of a, of a single whale is worth to us at least $3 million. In fact, if this whale if we could speak the human language, because they do speak their own language, and it's quite sophisticated language, but if they could speak our language, they would say something like this. Hey, guys, why don't you leave us alone? Stop killing us by hitting us with your ships. 
Stop, you know, stop polluting us with your plastic. Stop getting us caught by your nets. Stop blowing our ears out with your seismic and sonar testing in the ocean. And by the way, we're helping to keep you alive. So why don't you pay us for our service? If you want to pay that whale a wage for her grabbing carbon on behalf of humanity, you'd have to pay her about $70,000 a year. Her cousin on land, the elephant, is the same. Because the elephant is grabbing carbon over her lifetime in the forest, if we're, we can calculate what is the value of the carbon sequestration service of this elephant, and her work would be worth $2.6 million. Again, if you want to pay her a salary, it would be about 60 some thousand dollars a year for, for grabbing carbon on behalf of humanity. We can do the same. We can go back into the ocean. And this, for example, this is the work we're doing in the Florida mangroves with the Ocean Dock, uh, David Guggenheim's uh, outfit. And the, uh, if we were to value, because mangroves are grabbing carbon from the atmosphere, we, we can calculate that per square kilometer, that carbon is worth $1.6 million. We did this work for the salt marshes of the UK and the square kilometer uh, in of salt marshes is worth at least $1.5 million. This is very recent work that we're doing with Professor Carlos Duarte, who is a world expert on seagrass. We can show that the seagrass is worth, in terms of carbon sequestration alone, over a trillion dollars. Just imagine. That's, that's how valuable nature is worth to us. Science is telling us it's, it's incredibly valuable. And we can now value it in using our methodology for figuring out how much is the carbon sequestration service of, of nature, how much, how much, uh, how valuable is it? Now we can do the same, by the way, for the open ocean, the orphan I was telling you about. Remember, I told you it grabs 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide. That's a stock of carbon sitting at the, you know, below a thousand meters in the open ocean. If you multiply that by $60 per ton, not even a hundred you get at least $30 trillion. That's a gift of nature to all of us. This is a bequest for each and every one of us. This is given to us by the open ocean. So nature is incredibly valuable to us. And it's invaluable, it's valuable to us intrinsically and extrinsically in terms of ecosystem functions and ecosystem services to our society. So what really what we're really saying here is a living nature is a source of new wealth to humanity. In the language of finance, it's a new class of assets. Now you would think because science is telling us nature is valuable and I'm a financial economist, people like me come and they value nature. You would think money is coming into nature to protect it hand over fist. Unfortunately, this is the reality. This is how much money we need. We need about a trillion dollars to protect nature on a yearly basis. The commitments to protect nature and its biodiversity is woefully short. We see this low bar here. And it's mostly philanthropic giving and, of, and people that altruistic would like to give to protect nature. The financing gap that has been identified by many people is about between 500 and $700 billion a year. Now you may say to yourself, if we can get this gap if we cannot fill this gap, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to lose nature and its biodiversity, and we are losing it at, at a very fast speed. Question is, where is that money going to come from? You can say, well, maybe the governments can provide. Governments can provide a penny. Most governments are highly indebted. The world, as you can see, is, has, is going through a number of crises. Governments are not going to step in. You could proselytize more altruism and more philanthropy to people, but people are already voting with their money and they're saying, this is how much you're willing to give you. So how we fill that gap, my proposition to you tonight is maybe we can bring investment into nature. So what, this one I want to show you is that nature is an investable proposition above and beyond altruism and philanthropy. Let me make the case. So what I want to show you is we need to bring investment into nature. We need to create nature markets around nature in order, in order to protect nature. Remember why we're doing this, to protect a living nature 
and to protect the stewards of nature. And these would be the indigenous populations and the local communities. But in order to do so, these are the challenges that I've identified that we need to get over in order to be able to make this happen. First one is when you want to bring investment forward into nature in order to be able to scale up nature work, the investor is going to say, uh, can you tell me what the future looks like? So if I want to invest, let's say, I want to purchase the carbon of the, of the seagrass of the Bahamas. That's a project I'm working on. All right, can you tell me, Ralph, how much carbon will the seagrass of the Bahamas grab next year and the year after and the year after? And if I say why, he said, well, if you can't tell me how much, maybe I'll give you my money today. Maybe I'll invest today into the future. So that's the first thing we have to be able to do. Second one that we have to do, because we're talking about investing in nature, well, who owns this nature? Who can speak on behalf of its nature? Does nature speak for itself? Does it have its own personhood? Is, is nature an asset? Uh, what, what is our relationship with nature? You have to be able to, to deal with this issue in order to convert natural asset into natural capital. The third problem we need to deal with as we're bringing investments into nature, remember, people are going to be, let's say, sitting in the U.S., investing in the carbon of the elephants in Gabon. Well, they're saying, well, I don't know anything about Gabon. I don't know whether these elephants that I'm invest investing to protect, how do I know that you're looking after them? How do I know that they're doing well? I need, there's a problem of, of informational gaps and informational asymmetry. How do we deal with that problem? The fourth problem we have to deal with is if I invest in nature, how do I know that whoever owns that nature is going to be looking after it into the future? How do I know you won't change your mind after I give you my money and you replace the seagrass with a marina, for example? That's, that's a problem of time consistency, we say. And the fifth problem we have to deal with is issue of governments. We, when we talk about nature, and, and investing in nature, we need to ensure that the money is going to look after nature in perpetuity and the stewards of nature in perpetuity. So there's an equity issue here that we need to deal with uh, explicitly. So let me solve for you each one of them. In order to do that, I want to introduce you to a new concept. It's called science-based finance. What it really does, science-based finance recognizes the role of science in showing us how valuable nature is to us. Unfortunately, that science has never been valued up until this paradigm came about. What, what science-based finance does, it recognizes the role of the stewards of nature, indigenous uh, populations and local communities in protecting and restoring nature and the role of nature. And those two, be it the stewards of nature, have never been paid for their services. So really, conservation up until today was always looked at as a cost proposition. What science-based finance does, it values the role of science. What it values the, the, the value of nature in, in market terms. It recapitalizes nature because we need to recapitalize nature because we are losing it. And it pays the stewards for their role. And changes conservation from a cost proposition into a value proposition. That's the power of this new paradigm. Now, let me show you how we can apply it. Gabon has 57,000 elephants. It used to have about 190,000 elephants. Okay. So what, I, what we can propose to Gabon is to sell the carbon of its elephants, because the elephants are enhancing carbon in the, in the forests. And Microsoft and Google and all these hundreds and thousands of, of companies have committed to go carbon zero, carbon negative, carbon neutral. They can purchase the carbon of the elephants from Gabon. So by doing so, I want to show you how powerful this this. Um, this thing is the stock of elephants in Gabon from a carbon perspective is, would be worth at least $12 billion. Now those elephants are going to give 
birth to babies, they're going to grow from 57,000 to what they used to be, about 195,000, okay, before they were uh, poached and killed. So by going from 57,000 elephants to what used to be about 190,000 elephants in Gabon, we can increase, we, we can, that flow from 57 to 190 is worth at least $21 billion. In a sense, the value of elephant carbon to Gabon itself is $33 billion. Imagine. So the income that Gabon can get on a yearly basis from the sale, not of the elephants, you never sell the elephants. In fact, you can only get the value from the elephants if the elephants are frolicking freely in the forest, unaware of humans. They have no clue what we're doing. We're just, by them frolicking freely, they're enhancing carbon in the forest. That carbon is basically sold to those that need to offset their carbon footprint, and Gabon would be able to bring in about $950 million a year. This is another project we're doing in the Bahamas. I'm working with the Bahamas government to sell their, the carbon of their seagrass. Now, a very recent paper in Nature by Carlos Duarte and a group called Beneath the Waves, they did something really, really cool. They wanted to map the seafloor of, of the Bahamas, now, they know that there's a lot of seagrass at the, uh, the seafloor, and they know that sea turtles like to eat seagrass, and they know that tiger sharks like to eat sea turtles. So rather than dive and use submersible to figure out how much, how much seagrass is, is at the bottom of the, uh, at the, bottom, at the ocean uh, floor of, of the Bahamas, they fitted the tiger sharks with cameras. Now, I would not advise that you do that. It's a, it's a dangerous uh, idea, but I, I saw what these guys were doing. They turn, they, they grab the tiger shark, they flip it on its back, it goes into a trance, it goes very quiet. They put a 365 camera on it and they let it loose. Now, what, what the tiger shark does, it chases seagrass 24-7. And it and can cover 70, 70 kilometers a day. So what the tiger sharks did, they really actually the heroes here, they mapped the seafloor of the Bahamas, and Bahamas discovered that they're sitting on 30% of the total mass of seagrass in the world. Now, if you recall before, I told you the total mass of seagrass is worth a trillion dollars in terms of carbon. So imagine the amount of money that potentially, potentially, uh, Bahamas is sitting on. Now, why is that important? Because Bahamas is an island that has been decimated by a, a, a hurricane that hit the island about three years ago, killed thousands of people and put the country in debt 50% to GDP. So imagine now what they can, they be, what I've calculated for them is that there, by the way, their seagrass is about 93,000 square kilometers of seagrass, the largest in the world. And they have the ability to go by another 40,000. That 40,000, what we call additionality, restoring the seabed, is worth at least $145 billion. So Bahamas overnight, per capita, could be the richest country on the planet. Imagine. Okay? <clears throat> so... Ralph, yes. Ralph, I hate to interrupt you, but we're almost at time. Okay, so let me then finish very quickly. Okay, thank you. All right, just give me a minute. So the second problem is, is recognizing who's going to speak on behalf of nature. Here we go. In the case of the Bahamas, the government said, whoever, whatever carbon is sold in nature, be it blue or green, it, it belongs to the government. So we know who's on the other side of the contract. This is what I wanted to show you, is how do we structure this contract? So the buyer could be Microsoft, Google could be yourself. You want to offset your carbon footprint. You would pay money to whom? To all, to any of those. Could be mangroves, could be, could be the great apes, could be the whales, could be elephants, could be seagrass. And we use sensors and technology to make sure that the money is there to look at that these assets are doing well. We use blockchain technology to make sure that the indigenous people who are really the stewards of nature are receiving the funding and that the funding is there to look after nature in perpetuity. Protecting nature over time, we can do it through 
pro, pro, uh, building what we call a nature wealth fund that ensures that money is always there to look after nature in perpetuity. But I want to get to is once you do all of that, look what happens. There are no losers. This is my last slide. There are no losers in this, in this new economy. The sellers of carbon, they're going to get the money. They're going to get, by the way, the money that comes from sale of carbon is acyclical. It's orthogonal to the business cycle. So it's a natural hedge against the business cycle. It's a natural hedge against COVID. Tourists come, don't come, doesn't make a difference. People still need to fight climate change. What does Microsoft get from buying that carbon? They get to say they're reducing their carbon footprint. But because they're investing in the seagrass of the Bahamas, for example, they're also investing in biodiversity in terms of the turtles and the tiger sharks. And so, so there's an angle to, in terms of looking after nature, fauna and flora. And by creating resilience in nature, you're creating resilience in the people so they can claim SDGs 1, 8, 10, 13, 14, 15. And of course, the biggest winners are the indigenous populations and the local communities and nature itself. So this is what we call the win-win-win model. There are no losers in what, when, we, when we talk about a nature-based economy. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think we have, we have time for one question. I know that there are more than this in the chat and there's several that kind of fit into this frame, which is, this is a paradigm model that still is built on the backbone of capitalism and some claim that capitalism, there's lots of arguments that capitalism is what led us down this pathway. Dr. Jones talked about this in, for our current, current climate change. How is this model different? So uh, capitalism is, is um, you know, I'm a theoretician. I, I taught economic theory for a very long time. And we never, wh whoever teaches market economics never claims that it's about equity. Market economics is always about efficiency. If you care about equity, you have to bake it into the system. So you, 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 you design it. This, this is using market system to bring equity into it towards nature itself as a living system and towards the people, the local communities and, and indigenous population. So you don't leave it to the markets to do it. What you're really saying here is we, you know, it's, we're in the 11th hour and we need to bring in the markets because markets have $16 trillion and the ability to move very quickly, but they have never been, they've never been part of this conversation about nature itself. Okay, I come from the markets and people in the markets have all been ostracized. We're the evil ones, we sit outside. And the discussion about conservation was among activists and scientists. And you know they do high fives and they sing Kumbaya and then the world is dying as we speak. We need to bring in the market, but with the idea of protecting nature and protecting the people that live with nature. So it's by design you are using the market system to create an equitable and sustainable wealth. I thank you for sharing with us the real complexities of this system that all of us are living in. And to me, that's one of the powerful lessons of this yeah. is that we, we've such black and white thinking is not the way that's going to get us out of this. And that's hard. It is, it is because it, when, you know, when people say, well, we need to gut the system, I said, and replace it with what? We're in the 11th hour. What we need to do is get to the bank of the river because we're in, we're in this, uh, you know, uh, we are really facing existential risk and we need, we need all hands on deck. The people that have never been engaged are really the private sector, the financial sector that have been sitting on the side. By not engaging them, they've been funding extractive services. But when you make the proposition to them that a living nature, for example, take the, take the elephant. If you poach an elephant, the tusks will fetch $30,000. But a live elephant fetches $2.7 million as a minimum. So why would you want to kill an elephant? You see, same thing with a whale. A dead whale, where they eat whales still, it fetches $40,000. A living whale, at a minimum, is $3 million. And because I'm only focusing on carbon, I'm not even focused about the other ecosystem services that they provide. 
Same, imagine seagrass. Right now, currently, seagrass is lost because tourists, when they wade into the water at resorts, they complain that their feet touch seagrass. So I've watched, I've watched workers in resorts chopping the seagrass in the morning. I'm thinking to myself, this is gold. Guys, this is gold. You don't need the tourists to come. Just leave the seagrass alone. Leave the seagrass alone. And you can, and you can actually have an incredible living from leaving your nature alone. So the pricing here is to change people's behavior towards nature from an extractive relationship to a regenerative one. Great. I'm sorry we don't have more time for both you and Dr. Jones today. Great questions from our students. Thank you so much for joining us this Thank evening. Thank you for the opportunity. Today, at this, this evening today. Thank you. All right, we are going to transition now into our negotiation rooms. The links are in the chat for you again with your rooms. I'm seeing lots of backgrounds, that's fantastic. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna close this main room now. Thank you, Tina. And we're going to head to the, to the three rooms where you will get more instructions from the person who is leading your room. And thank you, Tina, for showing our facilitators. We're so, so pleased to have this great group of faculty facilitators from across our 23 universities participating with us. We'll see you, see you in the breakout rooms really soon. Bye.